it's like, wow, you know, I kind of like watch myself. It's like I'm standing outside of myself watching myself do this. And it's like, that's not me. It's like, uh, I don't feel like a guy named Gary. I feel like I'm an actor in a movie playing the part of a guy named Gary. And it's like, it doesn't really have anything to do with me. You know, at one point in the Course, Jesus says the body is outside of us and not our concern. That's how personally he took the body. It's outside of us, it's not even our concern. So when you hold your hand up in front of your face, what is that? Well, that is just a part of the same image as that chair there. It doesn't have to be any more personal to you. You don't have to identify with it. You know, it doesn't have anything to do with what you really are. What you really are is beyond the body, which brings me to the quote that I was thinking that Joe liked. There's this great paragraph that describes spiritual sight, describes vision. In the course, I think it's on page uh, 447 or so. Let's test it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it says, beyond the body, beyond sun and stars, past everything you see, yet somehow familiar, is dark of golden light that stretches as you look into a great and shining circle. And all the circle fills with light before your eyes. The edges of the circle disappear. And what is in it is no longer contained at all. The light expands and covers everything, extending to infinity, forever shining, and with no break or limit anywhere. Within it, everything is joined in perfect continuity. Nor is it possible to imagine that anything could be outside. For there is nowhere that this light is not. This is the vision of the Son of God, whom you know well. Here is the sight of him who knows his Father. Here is the memory of what you are. Yeah, and Joe really loved uh, that quote because it reminded him of spiritual sight. You know, Here's the memory of what you are. You get the memory of what you are by seeing it in others, by seeing it everywhere. That has to do with how the mind works. The Course understands how the mind works. Uh, nobody understands how the mind works, but the Course does understand how the mind works. It's beyond even Freud and Jung. Because it knows that once you get down deep enough you know, into that iceberg that is below the surface, once you get deep enough into the mind, there's only one mind. Yeah, it looks like there are seven billion people out there. That's a trick. It's all done with smoke and mirrors. There's really just one of us. What the Hindus would call the world of multiplicity. You know, the one appearing as many. So there's one of us. And if you get down deep enough into the mind, the mind knows that. The mind knows that there's really just one of us. Now that's good news and it's bad news. The good news is you can take that power and use it. The bad news is that your unconscious mind, left to its own devices, left without mind training, will run like a wild animal. You have to train it, just like an animal. But if you do that, that it's possible to use that power of oneness because your unconscious mind will interpret anything that you think about another person to really be about you. Yes. And that's a pretty disquieting thought at first. You wonder why people are depressed. Just look at the garbage they've been thinking their whole lives about other people in the world thinking that it was going out there into nearly fairyland when the truth was, it was really just going to them. And it will determine how you feel about yourself. 
and ultimately even what you believe you are. There's a very important law of the mind that is articulated in the Course of Miracles. It says, as you see him, you will see yourself. And it must be pretty important because then it says, never forget this. <laughs> <laughs> Because that person, you either find yourself or lose yourself. Yes. And God knows there are, well, God does nothing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there are billions of people out there every day losing themselves because they don't understand what they're doing. They don't understand what they're doing to themselves. But if they knew, that I would think that they'd get pretty damn careful about the way they think about other people because it's really just going to them. There isn't anybody out there. You know, I'll forget momentarily sometimes, you know, like that politician comes on the TV screen who I can't stand. <laughs> I won't name any names. <laughs> Donald Trump, but it's like... It's like <laughs> By the way, uh, it doesn't matter if you're a conservative or a liberal, okay? Because the whole thing is a setup. <laughs> we have been set up to divide ourselves. And you see it every day. Nothing but division and separation. That's the ego. So this guy comes on the TV screen, well, I can't stand. <laughs> and I have to remember, if I'm upset, who's the one who's suffering here? It's not him. He's probably having a good time. He thinks he's really the president. <laughs> I'm the one who's suffering here. I'm the one who isn't having a good time. But I could. If I remember what it's for. What is it for? What it's for is forgiveness. And if I can overlook the body, if I can overlook what this guy thinks he is, and remember who he really is, if I can think, you know what? He has this idea about himself that isn't true. Just like the Course of Miracles says, brother, what you believe is not the truth. And what you really are is nothing less than God. Not part of it, all of it. And if it's true that as you see him, you will see yourself, then when you think that way, you're sending a message to your own mind that that's what you are. Which is why the Course asks you a question, a pretty serious question. He says, can you to whom God says, release my son, be tempted to not listen, when you learn it is your own release from whom he asks? You're releasing yourself. That thing out there that you thought that you were releasing is just an image. And the Course says in the final section, choose once again, the images you make cannot prevail against what God himself would have you be. But you have to think. Spiritual sight is the way that you think. You know, so I can have a normal conversation with somebody who I just met, and you know, on the one hand, I'll have a normal conversation. I hope that you do. You know, you ever meet those people who they're just so damn spiritual you're sick of it? <laughs> I'll never forget what Ken Watkins said to me. He said, Gary, don't forget how to be normal. It's okay to be normal. You know, it's okay to carry on a normal conversation with somebody. It's okay to have normal relationships. It's, it's okay to get turned on by somebody. It's okay to uh, have things, to have money, you know, to have relationships, to have uh, success. You know, it's not against the rules. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know the truth. So you're having this normal conversation with somebody, and in the back of your mind, you know who they really are and what they really are. And what they really are is nothing less than God. 
exactly the same as God. And if it's true that as you see him, you will see yourself, and that is true, <laughs> then you're sending a message to your own mind that this is what you are. And if that's the case, well, then you're nothing less than God. Because God's entire kingdom was given to you as a gift. Not something you had to earn. It was given to you as a gift. It reminds me of Jesus' uh, beautiful prodigal son story. You notice in the prodigal son, uh, you know, this guy thinks that it would be a good idea to leave the father's house. And it turns out to be kind of a bonehead move. Because <laughs> all he finds is scarcity. You know, you can't have scarcity in perfect oneness. You have everything. But all the prodigal son finds is scarcity, and he ends up feeding pigs for a living. And he gladly eat what he's feeding to the pigs. But when he comes to himself, and that may be the most important part of the story, the most important part of the parable, because nobody can decide for you that it's time to go home. Only you can decide. Oh, you know what? I've been hanging around here long enough. I've been around the block a couple of times. This is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm ready to go home. And only you can decide that for yourself. Nobody else can. Nobody else can do your forgiveness work for you. You know, it's your decision. But if you make that decision, you'll notice in Jesus' story there that the prodigal son had some pretty strange ideas about himself. He thought he was guilty. He said, I sinned before God. I'm no longer worthy to be called his son. He has all these weird ideas about himself. He thinks that he's guilty. And what the prodigal son doesn't understand is that God doesn't share any of that point of view. Why? Because God is still perfect love. And all that perfect love knows how to do is love. If it knew how to do something else, it wouldn't be perfect love. So God is still love. And then you have this part of the son with the weird ideas about himself, going home with his tail between his legs, thinking, oh, I'm, I'm guilty. And in Jesus' metaphorical story, the father sees the son from a distance and runs to him and throws his arms around him. He says, this my son was lost, and now he's found. He was dead, and now he's alive again. And then you get to make Mary. That's how Jesus ends the story. He says, Did you get to make Mary? No. God likes to party. <laughs> <laughs> and all God wants is for you to come home. It's not any retribution waiting for you. There's no punishment waiting for you. Those are ego ideas. Those are human ideas. And the God of the Bible, you know, no offense to Christians, because I, uh, you know, like my father in law is a Christian and he was a Mennonite. And it's like uh, one of the most wonderful people I've ever met in my life, and I've met Christians who are among the most beautiful people I've ever met in my life. But at the same time, they have strange ideas. <laughs> like this uh, God who's supposed to be perfect love, acting very human. And what we do is we made up a God in our image. You know, the Bible says God made you in his image, don't. We made up a God in our image, and if you look at that God of the Bible, he has some very human characteristics. You know, getting eaten with people, punching people. You know, very human. But God is not human, and spirit is not human, and neither are you. Because you are spirit. And at first it seems like the Holy Spirit is outside of you, talking to you. But no, you are the Holy Spirit. You just forgot. Once you get up to the level of spirit, it's all the same. God, Christ, Jesus, Holy Spirit, Spirit, it's all oneness. Perfect oneness. The awareness of perfect oneness. That's the Course's definition of heaven. The awareness of perfect oneness and the knowledge that there is nothing else. Nothing else outside this oneness. Nothing else within. It's just perfect oneness. And you can experience that even while you appear to be here. Even while you appear to be walking around in body, having normal conversations with people. You can actually have the experience of your perfect oneness with God. Of course, calls it revelation. Of course, uses words a little different. 
know, this is not the imparting of intellectual knowledge. This is a direct experience of God, the way that uh, the Gnostics used to use the word gnosis. You know, it's actual experience of being with God in your state of perfect oneness, which is your natural state. And it's possible for you to experience that. You want to appear to be here, maybe it'll just last for a few seconds, but that's all you need. Because once you get a taste of that, it's like a preview of coming attractions. It's like, you know, you know what? That's going to be my reality forever, and I'll take it. <laughs> you know, give me some more of that. You know, uh, in this world, people are very hung up on sex. But your relationship with God is actually very sexual, which, you know, people don't like when I talk about that, but I'll talk about it anyway. Uh, it's like this perfect oneness with God, the Course describes it as the kind of feeling that is often sought in physical relationships, but physical relationships cannot achieve it. Because true union is only possible at the level of the mind. You know, so, uh, bodies cannot really join. I'm not saying we won't try. <laughs> but bodies cannot truly join. Only the mind uh, can really join. According to the course. And I, I believe the course. And uh, so, when you have that experience of being with God, it's a very sexual experience. It's like an orgasm. And, you know, I'm sure Christians will love that. <laughs> yeah. But what we've done in this world is we've made up relationships to try to substitute for the relationship that we think that we lost with God. We think we threw that away, and then we lost it, we blew it. She didn't use the word. <laughs> so I keep asking, uh, you know, what's the course's position on sex? And I think, I don't want to use the word position in sex. <laughs> It's a constant orgasm. You know, in, in this world, orgasms come and go. <laughs> uh, in heaven, it never stops. And it's like my teacher person, this beautiful woman, this exquisite, amazing, incredible, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> she said, imagine the peak of a perfect orgasm, except this orgasm never stops. It keeps going on forever, with no decrease in its powerful and flawless intensity. And I said, you have my attention. <laughs> I want what she said. <laughs> yeah. It's like when you're in that cell, it's a good one. I love what she said. And it's like, uh, it never stops. And there's no time, you know, so you may ask, well, isn't that kind of boring? <laughs> if it's always the same. <coughs> well, there's no time. So of course it's not boring. Boredom is only possible in time. Take away the time, you take away the boredom. It's just there. And that's it. And you don't need anything else. And you don't want anything else. You know, so when I'm in that dream and I'm having a bed at night and I wake up and I'm surprised to see that I never left the bed, it's the same with heaven. We never left. You're still there. You are home in God, dreaming of exile, the Course says, but perfectly capable of awakening to reality. You can wake up to reality. You are perfectly capable of that. You don't have to be a genius. You know, I never went to college. You don't have to be the, the smartest guy in the world the smartest woman in the world. But you have to want it. That's the key. You have to be motivated. And nobody can supply that motivation for you. 
That motivation can only come from you. But if you want it bad enough, you will have it. It's like, I, you know, I've met musicians who weren't that gifted. But they really wanted it. They wanted it to be good. So they practiced every day. Like it was the most important thing in the world. And you have to practice like your salvation is the most important thing in the world to you. But if it is the most important thing in the world to you, you will practice. You know, the Course says uh, about the words, I want the peace of God. It says to say these words is nothing. But to mean these words is everything. If you mean it, then you will practice every day. And if you practice every day, just like learning to play the piano. You practice every day, you're going to get good at it. And after a few years, you can be really good. Maybe after 10 years, you can be excellent. Maybe after 20 years, you can be one of the best in the world. But you have to want it, or else you won't practice every day. But if you want it bad enough, it is attainable, it is doable. The Holy Spirit wouldn't give you a job that wasn't doable. It wouldn't give you a job that wasn't possible. So it is possible. You can wake up in half a lifetime. You know, I, I talked to people who knew uh, Bill Fedford very well, the Coast Guard, of course, in Randall's. They were very clear that he was enlightened at the end of his life. Uh, Helen, not quite, because uh, yeah, she couldn't do the course. She understood the course better than anybody. Intellectually, she understood it better than anybody. She sh helped shape uh, Ken Wapnick's thinking about a course of parables. Uh, and she understood it better than anyone, but she, she couldn't do it. She said, I know the course is true, I just don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> because she couldn't experience the act of forgiveness. She had tremendous ego resistance, and everybody has some resistance at least to doing this because this is death to the ego and the ego senses it on some level and the ego is going to come up with a hundred different ways to complete its master game plan and you can see what temptation is according to the Course in Miracles in that first paragraph of the final section of the text choose once again it says, temptation has one lesson it would teach, in all its forms, wherever it occurs. It would persuade the Holy Son of God he is a body, born in what must die, unable to escape its frailty, and bound by what it orders him to feel. So there, right there, you have the ego's master game plan. That's you, that image that you see in the mirror. <laughs> when you're getting ready to go out, the ego has totally convinced you that that is you, so much so that you don't even question it. And the Course is saying, well, maybe you should question it, because that's not you. And that's not what you are. And the images you make cannot prevail against what God Himself would have you be. So, now the Course is completely replacing the thought system of the ego with the thought system of the Holy Spirit. I've never seen anything else do that. Now, I've been doing the Course for uh, 24 years, but I've looked at other things in the middle of you know, I always stuck with the Course, but I, I'm always looking at things. And I was on a spiritual path for 15 years before I started doing the Course. And I've seen a lot of things. And I've never seen anything answer all the questions and completely replace the thought system of the ego with the thought system of the Holy Spirit. So the Course doesn't just describe the problem, as so many people do. You know, a lot of people are really good at describing the problem. <laughs> but the Course actually gives you a solution to the problem. It actually gives you a resolution. And it d defines unconscious guilt in a way that makes you realize that it has to be healed. And nothing else even knows about that, much less healing it. <coughs> You know, and, and you know, I'm not here to put anybody down, but you see all these things like, uh, well, you know, the power of now. Well, you can't stay in the now 
if you have that unconscious guilt in your mind. You can't be free of pain if you have that unconscious guilt in your mind. You know, if you, if you use the law of attraction, you try to attract things to you that appear to be outside of you. That's just separation. But a sense of separation from God is the only life you really need to correct. And if you could undo the ego and get into a state of spirit, then you can be guided through your life by the Holy Spirit. And that's a totally different story than being guided by the ego. The Holy Spirit will lead you to some good things. Some really good things. The word inspired comes from the words in spirit. The more in spirit you are, the more inspired you can be. You can have ideas that will come into your mind that you never would have expected. You know, genius ideas can come into your mind. You know, maybe you have a business, you have an hard time making money. You know, and uh, all of a sudden an idea will just come to you and tell you how to make it work. That's an inspired idea. Now, you ever talk to people, uh, you know, they do something great, and you say, wow, that was a great idea, how'd you think of that? And they'll say, well, it just came to me. That's an inspired idea. It just comes to you out of nowhere. And it's like, oh yeah, yeah, that, that might work. And then you try it, and it works. That's when you'll start to get excited about those kinds of ideas. You had a question. Hey, thanks for watching. If you want more tips and tools on how to be a spiritual vixen, go on over to my website, MaureenMuldoon.com, and you can sign up for my love notes. Until then, I'm Maureen Muldoon, the spiritual vixen, reminding you to love more, fear less, and don't forget to laugh.